Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Chaffee and I'm director of the UCSD Retirement Resource Center. I'd like to welcome you all today to this wonderful presentation by Dr. Igor Grant on the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. I also, um, prior to uh, introducing Dr. Grant, I want to do a shout out to the Retirement Association Program Committee, which is responsible for setting up this wonderful series of presentations uh, being produced by the Retirement Association called Discover UCSD. So thank you so much. Uh, this talk was arranged by RA board member Matthew Zevye. And uh, it's one in a series that we call Discover UCSD. It is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Igor Grant. He is Distinguished Professor and Director of the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Program and the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, CMCR, at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Grant served as chair of the UCSD Department of Psychiatry from 2014 through 2019. He is neuropsychiatrist who graduated from the University of British Columbia School of Medicine in 1966 and received specialty training in psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania, 1967 through 71, and additional training in neurology at the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square, from 1980 to 1981 in London, UK. Dr. Grant's academic interests focus on the effects of various diseases on brain and behavior with an emphasis on translational studies in HIV and drugs of abuse. He has contributed to approximately 800 scholarly publications and is principal investigator of several NIH studies. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Igor Grant. Take it away, doctor. Everybody can hear? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. And then can you see uh, my first slide, which says medical cannabis? Uh, oh, actually it says update for the Superior Court. Just a second, Sean, did we um, pull up the wrong slide set? This will work, but I, I had actually customized one just for uh, the Retirement Association, but the data are very similar. Um, let's just go on with this one, Sean. I don't want to waste people's time. We, we did have a cover slide that was personalized, as I said. Okay, um, so um, what I'd like to just chat with you about today is um, some of the research that's uh, been done on medicinal properties of cannabis. And we'll uh, consider two specific cannabinoids. Uh, one is THC, which is, as you probably know, the psychoactive or high producing ingredient of marijuana. And then we'll also talk a bit about CBD, cannabidiol, which is also found in marijuana, but is a relatively non-psychoactive component that may have other kinds of medicinal properties. And so uh, to start, uh, first of all, this is an old botanical picture of cannabis sativa. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, the plant we're talking about. Um, I might say that um, cannabis sativa is a, um, a fairly uh, large uh, genus and species. Uh, and there are some different um, uh, varietals of it. But basically, it's the same plant. So even hemp, which you have read about, which uh, produces essentially no THC, but does produce CBD, is, is still uh, fundamentally the same genetics. And it's just that um, an enzyme that produces THC has been turned off. So um, 
The, um, of course, uh, as um, is true in our society as well, um, women rule, and so it is the female uh, uh, flower that produces the uh, active ingredient that, that, that people are interested in. So uh, I'm going to go on to the next one here. Um, I mentioned that there are um, two primary cannabinoids that we'll talk about today, but there are many, many others. Uh, this slide is a little bit dated, it says 80, but there, there are probably more. There are others being discovered. And whether some of those have medicinal properties as well, um, we just don't know, although research is beginning in that area. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Raphael Machulam, pictured here. He is an Israeli scientist. He celebrated his 90th birthday uh, this year, still active. And he really and his team are the ones who discovered back in the 60s what was the psychoactive ingredient, the primary psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, which is tetrahydrocannabinol or delta 9 THC, which you see pictured there. He also at about the same time, as isolated cannabidiol, and it wasn't clear what that compound was, although very early on, he noted that CBD may have anti-epileptic properties, and we'll come back to that story um, because it, it, it turns out that was a, a very good foresight. So moving on, um, uh, Cannabis is not a new medicine. Uh, uh, here is a little picture of a bottle of cannabis Americana. Um, I want to make note, it was American, made here in the USA. And uh, 1913, Eli Lilly Company uh, marketed it as an analgesic, hypnotic, antispasmodic, and powerful narcotic. Well, um, it turns out that some of those claims may well be true, um, as we will continue to show. Now, uh, marijuana, of course, went into eclipse in the 30s when it was um, uh, considered to be a harmful drug, an addicting drug, uh, possibly causing reefer madness and various things like this. And so uh, for a long, long time, really, research on marijuana stopped, medical research at least. But more recently, as you know, uh, there has been a movement nationally to, first of all, make at least medicinal cannabis available to people. Uh, and even more recently to just out and out legalize it. Um, I haven't looked recently at the map. This was as of, as of January, 2020. Um, you can see where the uh, fully legalized states are there in green and the ones um, that I've added in blue also have some kind of medicinal access law. So the majority of the country has that now. Now, um, one might ask, well, what has prompted this renewed interest in, in medicinal properties? And, and I would put it in a couple of categories. One is that there has been just persistent anecdotal evidence um, that marijuana is helpful to some people with some diseases. And the advent of HIV AIDS actually greatly moved uh, this idea forward because people with HIV AIDS um, do get a complication uh, sometimes called uh, painful peripheral neuropathy, which is a kind of painful hypersensitivity uh, and it is a complication of HIV AIDS, also of some medicines. Um, and there were just a lot of reports that it was helpful in managing this condition, but that was not the only. Uh, there are people who reported anti-epileptic benefits and uh, various other kinds of benefits. So, so that was one thing, a lot of anecdotal evidence. The second was uh, that um, there was kind of a political shift, which has been ongoing, wherein um, I think the public in general came to the view that marijuana wasn't that poisonous, that uh, despite um, it being in schedule one, which means it sits in company with heroin and things like this, um, uh, 
children of the 60s who grew up recognized that actually uh, there weren't, um, shall we say, uh, you know, a whole new generation of zombies walking around or uh, a lot of schizophrenia and uh, a lot of uh, other kind of disease that could be attributed to um, at least casual use of marijuana. So uh, I think that accounted for some of the political shift. Now, whether it's correct to say that it's perfectly harmless, we'll come back to that. Uh, nothing is perfectly harmless, but uh, one always um, looks at kind of a risk benefit calculation, any policy. Uh, then the uh, next important thing was really the scientific discovery of the places at which uh, marijuana, that is THC particularly, works biologically. Uh, and this led to the discovery of the um, cannabinoid receptors, which are the docking sites, if you will, in tissues where THC and similar compounds uh, have their action. And then, of course, um, since in nature, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, for example, animals evolve CB receptors simply to accommodate the marijuana plant. One then looked at what are the actual um, uh, uh, biological bases of, uh, of, these cannabino and, uh, of these cannabinoids. And what was discovered was uh, some molecules which are now called endocannabinoids, which are our internal signaling molecules that act on these cannabinoid receptors. And what has been found is that these molecules, two of which are well recognized now called anandamide and uh, 2-AG, arachidonyl glycerol, 2-AG, um, uh, have important and widespread actions uh, as modifiers uh, of physiologic systems. And what I mean by modifiers is that, for example, in the central nervous system, <clears throat> it may be that um, some signaling pathway is, uh, for example, stimulating, uh, so let, let's say, a dopamine pathway. Well, what the endocannabinoid system does is modify the actions of that. Uh, sometimes people have uh, called the endocannabinoids kind of the, the shock absorbers of the system or the regulators. Um, and and uh, that's not all they do, but there is truth to that concept. And of course, uh, more recently than uh, there have been development of synthetic molecules that in various ways interact with this endocannabinoid system uh, that have nothing to do with marijuana and may be the basis of new therapeutic agents in fact. Now, the little cartoon on uh, the right just shows uh, where are these uh, cannabinoid receptors uh, densely located. In this case, we're talking about the CB1 receptor. There are two that have been recognized, CB1 and CB2. CB1 seems to be the more neurologically active receptor. It's uh, very well represented in the brain, but it does occur in other parts of the body. And the CB2 seems to be more related to immune function. It's found in immune cells, found in the spleen and, and, and places like this. <clears throat> but the CB1 receptors, you can see that um, what the actions might be of, for example, THC, which acts on the CB1 receptor. So uh, you can see there is uh, a lot of green at the bottom of the brain there in the cerebellum, this part of the brain that has a lot to do with coordinating uh, movement mm. and motor control. And anyone who has observed somebody who's been really high on marijuana knows that they are uh, unsteady. And that probably is part of the uh, action there. Uh, people also uh, know that memory can be affected, at least uh, in the short term. Uh, and that uh, has to do with uh, distribution of these receptors, for example, in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain um, uh, particularly involved in, in learning and memory, and, and so on and so forth. 
So uh, I guess the bottom line here is that a confluence of factors have led to an interest in this topic and uh, prime among those has been really discovery of some of the mechanisms of action um, of the cannabinoids and the whole endocannabinoid system. I can pause if there's a question. Well, do you want to do questions by chat or how I should have asked? Um, I'll ask our chair, chairperson. How would you like to handle questions? Um, people can enter their questions in the chat and if I see it come in, then I'll read it out. Okay, perfect. All right, so shall I move on? Yes, please. Okay. All right, these cartoons really simply summarize what I've said already. Um, can you see my pointer moving across the screen? Yes, no, somebody? Can you yes. See an arrow? Okay, fine. Yes. So basically this is a cartoon of um, uh, uh, two nerve cells communicating with, with each other. And the blue balls here represent the primary signaling molecule. It could be um, uh, dopamine, it could be any of those things that you may have heard about. Um, and then the idea is that once those signaling molecules act on the uh, receiving cell, what can be generated simultaneously as a result um, is the release of these endocannabinoids. In this case, uh, 2-AG is pictured, and it goes back uh, to the original cell to modify the action that was originally uh, happening. So that's, in a nutshell, one of the ways the endocannabinoid system works. So it's kind of a circuit breaker um, uh, or modifier of activity. And so if the original signal, let us say, is one of excitation, the endocannabinoid system would tend to dampen that excitation. On the other hand, if the original signal had to do with um, uh, sedation or suppression, it might have the opposite effect. Okay, um, UC San Diego does have a, a Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research called CMCR, which is in the health sciences, and I'm the director of that. It has an interesting history, at least to me, an interesting history. Um, uh, first of all, we need to go back to November 1996. That's when the voters of California passed what was called the Compassionate Use Act of Prop 215. California was the first state in the nation to um, have a medical marijuana law. Um, what was of interest, though, is that a number of key legislators led by the, uh, the late Senator John Vasconcelos uh, who himself was a major proponent of medicinal cannabis. Nevertheless, he felt that the way the field would move forward was to develop real data uh, on uh, what were the usefulnesses and what was not useful. So he approached the University of California and through a long pathway that I won't bore you with, um, uh, I, I, I came to be uh, a lead faculty member uh, and that led to legislation California legislation that established the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research back in 2000 with the legislature uh, allocating funding. And, and um, then later on, uh, coming down to the bottom of the slide in November 2016, uh, as you know, voters passed Prop 64, which actually legalized marijuana in California. But within Prop 64 was a provision to provide funding to the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. There are many, many provisions in that uh, law uh, to do with uh, research and public health uh, uh, kinds of activities. But, but one, of, uh, one of the beneficiaries was UC San Diego and our center. So um, one might say, well, why uh, has it taken so long to even figure any of this out? Uh, after all, marijuana has been around a long time. Uh, part of the reason is it's not been legal really to do research in this area, at least medical research. I actually should modify that. It's not that it's been illegal, it's just been very difficult. And this uh, dizzying little set of boxes and arrows is mostly meant for me to comment that for us to do our research, which we began to do in the 2000s, 
the only legal source of marijuana for medical research purposes was the federal government itself, which has a farm at the University of Mississippi where they grow marijuana and then they can ship it to investigators. But you have to ask for it. And in order to ask for it, you have to go through many, many steps. Um, and so uh, CMCR, for example, which is in California, um, in addition to getting, obviously, Institutional Review Board Human Subjects Approval, also has to go to a California panel called RAPC, Research Advisory Panel of California, which rules on any uh, narcotic drug type of research. At the federal level, uh, you have to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration through this uh, uh, Investigational New Drug, or IND. You then have to go to the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. The DEA has branches, obviously, in Washington, but also local, so you have to get national approval, and then locally, inspectors come to look at your site. Those of you who are familiar with the UC San Diego campus might know that on the medical school campus, we still have these uh, kind of trailer-like buildings that are situated um, there, uh, one of which housed what was called a clinical research center outpatient facility at the time. And so some of our research was proposed for that facility, but when the inspector came, they said, okay, where are you going to store the marijuana? Well, okay, it's going to be in this safe, in this lock container. Uh, but then the inspector said, well, yeah, but um, this trailer isn't bolted to the concrete pad. What if, uh, what if the whole thing was moved? <laughs> so, so one had to develop uh, an approach to anchor the safe to the uh, to the concrete in order to assure people there wouldn't be a uh, diversion uh, of the product. Anyway, these are just some examples. It takes about a year or more between the time we at CMCR might approve a project uh, and the time that a study could actually get uh, the drug. By the way, I said approve a project. CMCR is not only a place that does some research, it's also a funding uh, mechanism. So we work a little bit like a very micro version of NIH uh, and investigators in the state can um, put in proposals, we evaluate them through external peer review, and then we provide funding, usually kind of preliminary funding, funding for proof of principle or early phase studies. And I'll describe a couple of those in a moment. Uh, some of the studies that we funded have been in various campuses. Um, and here's just an example of a type of study uh, that was done. So I mentioned the condition called painful peripheral neuropathy, which is a kind of chronic hypersensitivity uh, pain. It often affects the feet and hands. Um, it's, it's very unpleasant. Um, uh, and it does not respond well to regular pain medicines, for example, like ibuprofen or aspirin or Tylenol. It doesn't respond that well to opioids, actually, like codeine or uh, even stronger opioids. Uh, those things are very good for certain kinds of pain, particularly acute pain, such as post-surgical pain uh, or the pain of a fracture. But this is a different kind of chronic pain, and the usual pain meds that work there don't work well with this. Uh, there are treatments, of course. Um, most of them have to do with use of low quantities of um, certain antidepressant drugs, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, uh, and drugs of that type. Now, um, so the question was, HC containing marijuana help with this neuropathic pain. This is a study that was done by Professor Donald Abrams at UC San Francisco uh, with the funding that we provided to them. And the basic idea was this. He took uh, a group of people with um, HIV AIDS who had this neuropathic pain. Um, and I'm just going to pause for one moment. This is the problem of working at home. Somebody's banging on my door. Can you hang on one moment? Do you 
seized it. The federal was... government seizing his marijuana. <laughs> Let's hope not. Okay, my apologies. Uh, no worries. As I Can say, these are... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I, it was so funny uh, on this uh, uh, ki kind of theme. I remember watching uh, on CNN some uh, famous medical expert being uh, uh, opining, and then his grandson came along and <laughs> kind of grabbed him as a four-year-old. It was such an interesting little, uh, just the world we live in now. <laughs> we do have a few questions that have come in on the chat. Do you want to let me know when you're ready to field a few? Let me finish just with this segment, and then yes. there'll be a place I can naturally pause, and why don't we deal with it then, okay? Perfect. Give me a Thank few you. more minutes, if that's all right. You bet. Okay. So I was just saying, uh, the, uh, so he had, a, Dr. Abrams had a group of persons with HIV AIDS who had this condition of painful peripheral neuropathy. And so what he did was uh, did um, a fairly comprehensive evaluation of all of these people uh, on an outpatient basis, including ratings of their uh, pain severity. Uh, then he uh, brought them into uh, a research unit at uh, San Francisco General Hospital, uh, studied them a little more, and then randomized them, that is randomly assigned them to one of two conditions. One of the conditions was to receive smoked marijuana that contained 4% THC. And the other was to uh, uh, give them smoked marijuana from which uh, the cannabinoids were taken out. Uh, so decaf coffee versus caffeinated coffee. You could think of it that way, I suppose. Uh, and then uh, they had a five-day inpatient treatment uh, and were evaluated, and then they were followed after the treatment. So what you can see is on the y-axis where it says VAS pain score is the severity of self-rated pain. So the higher the number, the worse is the pain. Uh, and then on the bottom, you can see days before, after hospitalization and so forth. And you can see that the red people uh, who got the active THC improved more in terms of their pain scores. And that, that effect continued to uh, be there for a number of days even after the treatment ended. But then once the treatment truly ended, they returned to the same level as the people who received the dummy marijuana. Uh, important to note, the dummy marijuana or placebo marijuana also had some improvement a little bit, and this is your famous placebo effect. So this is the importance of doing these randomized double-blind studies, because you often do see a benefit from things from which you wouldn't accept, expect a benefit, unless one would argue that there was some other factor X in the um, placebo marijuana that also was active. That's, a, I suppose, a, an alternative hypothesis. I, I think it's unlikely, though. So um, this is the kind of study that suggested that there could be some benefit. And here in this table just summarizes some of these early studies. You see they're mostly small scale studies. Uh, they were mostly focused on neuropathic pain. Uh, one had to do with uh, muscle, severe muscle spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Um, but the interesting thing is, if you can see the, can you guys see the column on the extreme right where it's got plus and pluses, right? You can scroll tell. over to it, yes. Uh, because your faces are covering my portion of the slide. I, I yes. I yeah, but you can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So it just shows that um, every study actually had a positive result, which actually was a surprise to me and, and some of my colleagues. We kind of fully expected, well, at the end of the day, some, some would say yes, some would say no, it would be in between and we'd still be scratching our heads. But in fact, that didn't happen. Uh, and uh, for, uh, I think we can conclude that at least in the short term, neuropathic pain is definitely uh, benefited. Uh, from this. I'm just going to go past this um, and show you a couple more slides and then I'll come back to the other one. So to the extent that it works, how good is it? 
Um, and uh, there are a number of metrics to look at the uh, efficacy or powerfulness uh, uh, of a treatment. Uh, one metric is called number needed to treat. And all you need to know basically is that the lower the number, the more effective the treatment is. So, um, and this chart here com compares now for neuropathic pain, uh, what's the relative um, uh, uh, power or uh, strength of the effect uh, for common analgesics. I mentioned the antidepressants before and the old line so-called tricyclic antidepressants whose trade names were things like Elevil, Tofranil, Amitriptyline, Imipramine, and so forth, actually are very good agents. And interestingly, they are effective at doses that are not really antidepressant doses. So it's not that uh, everybody with neuropathic pain is depressed and so you treat their depression, they feel better. Uh, but rather these are usually given at much lower doses than would be typically used for uh, depression treatment. And you, and you can see that cannabis is kind of there in between. It's kind of neck and neck with gabapentin, which is a commonly used agent. Uh, it seems to do a little better than lamotrigine, which is another commonly used agent, and it it's, seems quite a bit better than the uh, SSRIs, which are the antidepressants of the Prozac uh, type. So um, the other uh, interesting finding uh, among uh, our studies were that the actual strength of THC needed to achieve these effects were quite low. So uh, on the left-hand side is a study that Dr. Barth Wilson who is, uh, was at UC Davis at the time. Uh, and he, he used uh, three strengths of marijuana. One is 0% THC, another was 1.29. I don't know if it was really down to the second decimal, but call it 1.5% and uh, call the other one 4%. Uh, and you can see he, he saw an effect for even the lowest uh, active in uh, uh, preparation of marijuana. And um, another study that was done actually by Mark Wallace here at UC San Diego, uh, with, which had to do with volunteers and uh, really inducing a kind of pain by injecting capsaicin into their arms, uh, which kind of mimics this neuropathic pain, found that um, medium doses of marijuana, that is about 4% 4 THC, did produce um, uh, an optimum benefit in, in these uh, participants. But actually, as you push the dose higher and higher, uh, you didn't see the same benefit. In fact, uh, they kind of got worse. So this raises the question of a therapeutic window that is it the case that uh, modest doses of THC can be helpful? Low doses, very low doses are, could be ineffective, but higher doses actually uh, produce um, uh, opposite or side effects. And um, I'll just conclude this section of my talk and then we can pause for the questions by saying that um, uh, you know, CMCR studies were obviously small. You could say, well, what can you conclude from that? But the reason I have some confidence in our um, um, impressions is that the National uh, Academies then of uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine did a very large survey of the existing literature on medicinal cannabis. Uh, I don't know, that shouldn't have gone there. Um, and they produced a report, which is thousands of pages, but, um, and it's on our website, cmcr.ucsd.edu. But what's good is they do have summaries, so you can, you can glance through the, the main points. But they concluded that at least as of 2017, there was uh, very substantial evidence uh, of um, marijuana efficacy, and but here we mean marijuana, THC-containing marijuana in chronic pain, spasticity, uh, in multiple sclerosis, which I mentioned, and control of nausea, which has been known for some time because there's actually a THC, a legal THC you can buy called Marinol, 
which uh, has been uh, approved for the treatment of nausea, particularly <coughs> in cancer treatment. And then you can go down the list. They uh, thought there was moderate efficacy uh, in, in terms of control of uh, sleep uh, or improving sleep, but prob probably where sleep is complicated, uh, sleep disturbance is complicated by um, pain. Uh, and then they said there was limited efficacy in some of the other places and no or insufficient evidence elsewhere. The place where this report is dated, you can see in the bottom bullet it says treatment of cancer's irritable bowel syndrome, epilepsy. That is not true anymore. Since then, we have found that um, there uh, is an indication, at least for the cannabidiol cannabinoid in the treatment of epilepsy, uh, certain epilepsies of children, and, and I will come back to that. Let me then stop here because, uh, yeah, uh, and see what the questions are. All right, we have quite a number of questions. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Grant. Could the apparently increasing incidence of memory impairment in baby boomers be related to pot use years ago? <laughs> um, may I ask the questioner, what is their evidence that baby boomers have a lot of memory impairment? <laughs> Because I'm, I'm not aware of that trend, but maybe there's some data. If the question uh, maybe, maybe they can, yeah. So, um, but it uh, seriously raises this question because uh, obviously there's been a lot of concern that marijuana use could lead to neurological, psychiatric, and other medical problems. And this, um, issue has been looked at uh, very extensively, including in this report that's before you now. Um, and the bottom line is the use of marijuana, at least under the conditions of use that we have had since the late 1960s, which means not super strong, uh, you know, uh, kind of your, 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 uh, uh, very high THC containing products, which are uh, available now, but which weren't then, under conditions of use of the last four decades, there is really no substantial evidence of uh, neurocognitive impairment that is long lasting. It is obviously true that if a person is stoned, they have trouble remembering and learning, and they have other kinds of issues when they're stoned. But the real question is how lasting is that effect? And even if you've been a marijuana user for say a decade or two and you stop, do you then have residual neurologic or other medical injury? And I think the data, uh, at least at this point, do not support the idea that people get brain damage, uh, at least adults, let me limit it, adults uh, do not get brain damage from using marijuana, at least the way it was used in the past. Now, if somebody subjects themselves to 20% THC containing pot for a decade, the answer might be very different, okay. Thank you. Also, um, yeah. just to touch on another point, a lot of people have uh, been concerned, well, what about lung cancer? Uh, emphysema, COPD, these, these kinds of things. And that's been looked at very extensively as well, including by our UCLA colleague, Dr. Tashkin. And again, there's really very little evidence of increased serious lung disease. Do people have cough and phlegm and things like that? Yes, they do. But as far as emphysema, no. And uh, lung cancer is also another no. Uh, again, this report actually reviews that very extensively. May, but maybe I went beyond the uh, the framework of the question here. No, that's excellent. Thank you. So is the center accepting patients? And if so, how is the referral given? What would be the health condition that would enable someone to be considered? Okay, let me come back to a slide I skipped. Um, and here are some of the current studies that we are supporting, not all of which, by the way, are in San Diego. Um, but um, there is a study that is uh, actually uh, finalizing now. I don't think they're recruiting, uh, and it's comparing smoked or inhaled cannabis, at least, 
tudranabinol, which is this Marinol uh, pill preparation in low back pain. There is a study that is just uh, finished on uh, essential tremor. Um, uh, there is a study ongoing now and recruiting that uh, Professor Doris Trauner is leading on CBD, in this case, in severe autism. Uh, and if you go to the cmcr.ucsd.edu site, uh, I think there is a place where you can register an interest in participating in a study. If you cannot find it, you can email me and I will direct you to the right place. Um, we are going to be study, starting a study on CBD in schizophrenia. This will be uh, led by Dr. Kristen Cadenhead, a psychiatrist here at UCSD. Um, there is a vaporized cannabis in neuropathic pain, but that is ending. Um, there's a study that's actually looking not at administering marijuana to people with bipolar, but, but looking actually at those who do use it, uh, what is the effect on their endocannabinoid system and is there a unique effect between bipolars and non-bipolars? There's a study that will start uh, at UCLA on rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which as you may know is a painful chronic inflammatory uh, joint disease. We are going to be starting a study of CBD in people with sleep problems. That's uh, Professor Mariana Turner here will be leading that. And so that is a study that will be enrolling. Um, there's going to be a, a very small preliminary study on anorexia nervosa uh, led by um, uh, uh, faculty in Dr. Walter Kay's group who have an eating disorder center here. Uh, number 10 is a study at UCLA on cannabigerol. Uh, 11 is uh, if you, uh, the, the one on driving has finished. CBD to reduce alcohol cra uh, craving is actually an animal study, so you can't enroll in that. And then there's a, a, a study at UC Merced that we're supporting. So does that answer the question about what the studies are and what you can enroll in potentially, or at least indicate an interest in? Yeah, so you can just go on the website and indicate an interest directly. Yeah, I believe, I haven't looked at the website. Maybe I will ask uh, Sean, if, uh, sh uh, who's uh, providing my IT support. I don't know if Sean, if you could in independently go on the website and see, is there a place people could just register an interest so we can get back to them. Uh, maybe Sean can look at that and let us know in a minute. Okay, and then you, you mentioned the study on um, usage and driving. You said that's concluded? Yeah, that study had to do with, um, uh, th there are two driving studies actually. Uh, one has finished. Uh, that had to do with uh, actually bringing people in and using a driving simulator in our labs. Uh, while people uh, smoked either active or inactive marijuana. That study is finished. A new study that uh, Professor Tom Marcotte is going to be starting uh, in combination or in coordination with the CHP is to see if the combination of marijuana and alcohol has a uniquely um, uh, you know, additive or a multiplicative effect on driving performance. Because it turns out that uh, marijuana does affect driving performance, but the effect is not very large uh, uh, compared to say alcohol. But because uh, it may be the case that people who feel they're safe driving after drinking a beer or two, and maybe they are safe, and who may feel safe after smoking a joint or vaping, whatever they do, and that may also be true, but the combining the, of the two is not true. That there, there may be a, a really multiplicative effect on driving competency from even low, low combinations of these two drugs. So that study will be starting. Uh, I don't know all the absolute details, but again, uh, if Sean can tell us whether people can indicate an interest, Dr. Marcotte could get back to that person. 
Okay. You mentioned that there would be a couple of CBD studies. Uh, one of our members asked if uh, you have an opinion on the, the current CBD market uh, with many, many products that are out there, some with THC and some without. Yeah, actually, let me, uh, to, to answer that question, can I flip ahead to a further part of my presentation? Please. I'm going to skip over a bunch of things here because, um, uh, but um, that's fine but I want to just talk about CBD because I know there's an interest here. Okay, so CBD, first of all, it's chemically very similar, um, but it's also very different. Uh, and a major difference is that I've talked a lot about these uh, cannabinoid receptors that THC acts upon. CBD actually does not act on those receptors in any significant amount it works through some other mechanism. So that's the first important uh, point to take away. There has been a suggestion, both anecdotal and a little bit of scientific literature, that CBD may have anti-inflammatory properties, also may be analgesic, pain management, um, uh, possibly hypnotic, uh, might be useful in drug abuse treatment, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, antipsychotic, anticonvulsive, and so forth. So uh, what are some of the data? And then I'll come back to the question of what you, what you buy and what, what kind of, is that any good? So this was uh, an important study that was done a couple of years ago where uh, the investigators looked at the possible use of cannabidiol in children with uh, an intractable form of epilepsy. Uh, well, there are two actually. One is called Lennox Gusto, another. Anyway, the details don't matter. Uh, but these are kids whose epilepsy was very difficult to control, and they found that in, indeed adding CBD was helpful. So I think there's good evidence that CBD has an anti epileptic effect. Whether it's broadly effective in other epilepsies, we don't know, and there are studies ongoing to try to figure that out. I might say, that the doses of CBD that needed to be given were quite high and much higher than you would get in a typical dispensary situation. Again, we can talk about that. Uh, another set of studies was looking at anxiety. Uh, CBD does seem to have anti-anxiety actions. Uh, basically what all these charts show is the following. The investigators found some people who had social uh, or more, or more uh, accurately public speaking anxiety. They have trouble uh, speaking in public, delivering lectures and so forth, would get extremely anxious and so on and so forth. And then they found, and then there were some people who uh, didn't have that problem. And what the investigators did was had them come into the lab and then they had to deliver a talk on television, on closed circuit television, and they were monitored before, during, and after their talk as to their level of anxiety, their level of self-doubt, these kinds of things. Uh, and then some people got CBD and some did not. So what you see is if you look in the left-hand panel and at the little gold triangles where people are at the bottom, those are the non-anxious people, the people who never had trouble with public speaking anxiety when they were made to go on television, which is uh, item A there at the bottom. Uh, they had oh, a little bit of tension, I guess, like we all do, but basically they were fine. And then the people who do have public speaking anxiety are represented in the blue and red. The red people got the placebo, so they had lots of anxiety, as you would expect and the people in blue got the CBD, and so their anxiety was lessened during this public speaking task. And more interestingly, uh, part of the anxiety is also saying to yourself, oh, I'm just terrible, what a loser, and so on and so forth. These negative statements, they were uh, pretty much obliterated in the CBD condition in the anxious people. So the, the, these are kinds of data that suggest there may be anti-anxiety effects uh, of CBD, and there are trials even of using CBD in post-traumatic stress disorder as another serious complicated anxiety uh, condition. Um, and the other I'll show you is to do with 
schizophrenia. Again, I, I think the, the chart I would have you look at is panel C, it's in the bottom left. Basically what these investigators did was uh, they had a gr group of people with schizophrenia. They measured their psychotic symptoms through, through certain kinds of observer rated uh, questionnaires. The symptoms were then divided into what are called positive and negative symptoms. Uh, positive symptoms being hallucination and agitation, negative symptoms being withdrawal, not wanting to deal with people, kind of that, those symptoms. And what panel C shows is that um, the people who uh, received an antipsychotic drug, a typical antipsychotic drug, which is the dotted red over here, um, uh, act, well, uh, dotted red here, had improvement in these negative symptoms, but the CBD folks actually had even a better improvement in the negative symptoms. In terms of overall and general symptom improvement, there was no difference between CBD and the antipsychotic, both worked. But uh, there was this suggestion that CBD might actually help with the negative symptoms. And also, um, this slide shows that the antipsychotic drugs do have bad side effects too, such as uh, neurological, increased neurological symptoms, tremors and such, where CBD didn't. So these kinds of data suggest that there may be some, um, uh, some benefits to CBD. Now, come back to your question. What was the specific question? About uh, the CBD. About CBD, I think. Do you, uh, could you reread that question so I can now Certainly. Open? What is your opinion of the current CBD market or products, some with THC and some without? Yeah. Okay. So as to the products, um, you know, there are a couple of things to be mindful of. First of all, if you go to a dispensary and let's say you say, I want to buy some CBD for treating my sleep disorder, whatever it may be, look at the label. Uh, and see uh, what is the actual dosage that is available to you. What you will find is in many cases, the doses are very small. So for example, the studies I referred to gave several hundred milligrams of CBD a day uh, to these people with schizophrenia or these um, uh, kids with epilepsy. Whereas what you might get in a bottle is 10 milligrams, you know, much, much lower dose. So that's the first question. Are you getting, assuming CBD works for the thing you want it to work for, are you getting enough of it? And, and to get enough of it, can you afford it? Because uh, you might have to buy so many bottles to figure that out. Uh, the second has to do with, um, is what is on the label actually there? Um, I think the answer is probably yes, because the Bureau of Cannabis Control does require uh, these uh, uh, providers to go to licensed labs and look at uh, what's the content. Uh, although the state may set up actually an independent facility to check that out periodically. I think, I think that would be a good thing if that was to happen. And the third thing had to do with THC. So again, my personal hunch is that for something like, uh, say, anxiety control, epilepsy control, um, probably CBD alone uh, is the um, effective ingredient. For something like sleep or uh, agitated behavior, say, with dementia patients, it may be that adding the THC is actually important because in low doses, it does have a more, um, it has some sedative properties. Uh, and then uh, in terms of neuropathic pain, it's probably the THC that's the important thing, not the CBD. So it is complicated and I don't think we actually know uh, whether there are some ratios or combinations of CBD and THC which are optimal. 
May I follow up to that question? You just sure. mentioned that in some of these products, it's uh, like 10, whereas you may need a factor of 200. Is yeah. it safe to be taking 20 units? We don't know uh, because again, the, yeah, I, and I don't mean to say you should now take 20 bottles of something, <laughs> please. I hope I didn't give that message. What, right. what I'm trying to indicate is that the science so far has used much higher doses and it was for good reasons. They were treating some very serious conditions like schizophrenia. Uh, it may be the case that lower doses are effective we just don't know. The, the science isn't there. So now, if you take a low dose, that's probably safer, uh, although CBD is reasonably safe, even in large doses. Um, the lower the dose you take, the less likely you are to have some kind of unexpected side effect. So I suppose one could um, try it out at, uh, you know, a low dose and a slightly higher dose, uh, that kind of thing. Okay. And another question was on a long-term continuous usage of marijuana, can it have an effect on mood, sleep, uh, sleep interruption, and anxiety? Yeah, complicated question. Um, first of all, um, obviously uh, THC is a mood altering substance and it also uh, alters people's state of awareness, uh, cognitive functions and so forth as we described. Now, one thing that happens when people do use uh, cannabis uh, for long periods of time and, and let me for the moment just use the example of, you know, using marijuana say daily, but at a reasonably low dose. One thing that happens is that there is a process of habituation such that some of the negative effects such as on coordination and such actually get less. So basically we get used to it. Um, whereas some of the effects uh, don't change that much. Uh, so if a person is wanting to get high, uh, they still get high. So there's kind of this dissociation that occurs between some of the uh, undesired effects and, and the desired effects. Now, in terms of very long term, uh, okay. And then the question was, well, can it affect your mood in the long term um, and so forth? The problem there is we don't have a perfect experiment in nature. The people who use marijuana regularly, chronically, at least historically, are probably not a random sample of the general population. Because given the fact that marijuana has been illegal, still is illegal uh, federally, uh, for someone to use it regularly and risk maybe getting caught or having some other opprobrium, uh, means that they really want it or need it for something. And what is that something? Often these are folks who do have anxiety, who do have a mood issue, who have sleep problems to begin with. And, and in addition to whatever pleasure they get from the marijuana, they perceive it gives them some kind of benefit. So there's this very uh, complicated and difficult to unravel association between what you bring to the table in the first place, are you an anxious person and, and so on and so forth, uh, and what it does to you. Uh, the final thing I would say though, is that for people with major psychiatric disorders, chronic marijuana use is not a good thing probably because it does uh, tend to destabilize mood um, and, uh, you know, could have under other undesired uh, effects. So uh, that's a very long-winded answer. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, I guess my bottom line is that, you know, occasional use of marijuana by kind of regular folks isn't going to do anything bad, uh, as long as you don't drive stoned or something and do something silly. Um, but chronic heavy use could have long-term effects, particularly in people who are vulnerable to psychiatric conditions. Thank you. 
Are there any good studies of chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain, more constant numbness, pain, and the therapeutic benefits of CBD or CBD THC together, permanent neuropathy after chemo? The studies on neuropathic pain that I have, that I am familiar with, have been largely to do with uh, neuropathic pain related to HIV AIDS, diabetes, and um, there have been some in the AIDS studies, people who got neuropathic pain as part of their antiviral treatments. Uh, I am not aware, that doesn't mean it isn't there, of a study that specifically looked at uh, uh, cancer chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain, which is a serious uh, um, side effect of, of these treatments. My speculation would be, based on what I know about neuropathic pain, is that a THC-containing product, probably low doses of THC, might well be beneficial in uh, this chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. I don't know that CBD necessarily would be. CBD seems to work more on pain that's related to inflammatory conditions, whereas the um, anti-neoplastic chemotherapy-related uh, neuropathic pain tends to be much more uh, at the level of disturbing the function of the uh, neuron itself. Okay. So, uh, I, don't, so I, I would guess that it would work, probably, probably low doses of THC, but to my knowledge, the studies have not been done on that specific indication. Thank you, Dr. Gett. With so many questions from our members, have you seen cases in which back pain increased each time marijuana was taken via edibles? I am, no, I, well, I haven't seen that. Um, in fact, you know, one of the studies we supported was exactly the opposite direction, was uh, seeing whether uh, Marinol uh, which is the oral form of uh, THC versus inhaled, actually benefited back pain. That study has not, it, although it's completed enrollment, it hasn't, it, has. um, it hasn't analyzed the data to my knowledge. So we'll know more about that. But I haven't, I haven't heard about the opposite effect. Doesn't mean it's not there, but I just don't know about it. Okay, and does the method of drug delivery, smoking or eating, influence pain relief effects? It probably does, and the study I was just describing was looking at exactly that question because it was comparing Marinol, the oral THC, to an inhaled uh, THC. Um, I think there is some reason to think that at least in terms of speed of um, improvement, that uh, taking uh, THC through an inhaled form, or possibly if there were a sublingual or, or some, some other kind of preparation, something that bypassed the gut basically, might work better. Because what we find is that um, uh, because, because THC is basically kind of an oil, um, it is absorbed irregularly through the gut. Uh, and anything that goes into the gut also then goes to the liver, uh, which tries to kick out things it doesn't like. So the actual blood level or even tissue availability of THC taken by mouth uh, is low, the bioavailability is something from 6 to 15 percent, basically. So call it 10 percent for short. So if you take, uh, you know, 10 milligrams, you're getting the benefit of one milligram uh, at the end of the day. Whereas when you inhale it, it, it really goes directly into the circulation and probably uh, the bioavailability is much, much higher. So again, without uh, uh, there being an actual study that has now analyzed its data and reported, my guess would be that uh, um, an inhaled form would work better. Thank you. How effective is topical CBD or THC? I have no idea. And that's something that needs to be done. Um, uh, and that study has not been done, basically. Okay. Do you have an opinion on CBD use for pets? 
Yeah, it's being marketed for high-strung dogs in particular. Well, some dogs are just like us, it seems. Um, high-strung owners and high-strung <laughs> pets. Uh, I am assuming uh, that to the extent um, CBD has an anti-anxiety action, which I think it does, uh, and if pet anxiety has the same basically neurological mechanisms, that it probably it could be helpful. But species are very different. So for example, um, you know, people, or at least some people, like to use marijuana. You know, they'll take it voluntarily. Uh, you can't get rats, rats to take it for, uh, you know, for pay or anything. They really don't like it. Now, we can force them into it, but they don't like marijuana. So I don't know where dogs fit in on the, <laughs> on the <laughs> liking and not liking of cannabinoid continuum, but, but you, you do have to be mindful there are species differences. Okay. Uh, can you tell us the difference between indica and sativa? Yeah, this is also a very muddled question. As I said right at the beginning, there's basically the one plant, uh, and it's got many, many little uh, varietals. Um, I do not know that things that are labeled as indica or sativa actually are that different in terms of their CBD and THC content. They could be, and maybe they're not. I think it's very important um, if, if one is going to buy marijuana at a dispensary to look at the actual chemical analysis and not go by the, you know, whether it's called, I don't know, Blue Hawaii or whatever, <laughs> but, but to actually look, what does what the chemical analysis show? Uh, Okay. Well, I've exhausted all the questions, but I think you still had more slides. So if you would care to cover anything in addition uh, to what you've covered so far, we'd be more than happy to listen. Well, I think our time is kind of up. And actually, through your questions, you have uh, pretty much anticipated most of my slides. Let me just kind of um, finish on the driving thing, which there was some interest in. Um, and, and some of the results were kind of interesting here. I thought the, this is the study that Dr. Tom Marcotte did here at UC San Diego. And again, his study had to do with basically bringing people to our labs. We have especially in, uh, equipped rooms where somebody can smoke or inhale the marijuana and the, the rooms themselves are negative pressure. So they kind of vacuum out all the smoke and fumes. Uh, I always joke, but uh, yeah, that's nice. But I don't know how many of our students are sitting on the roof there uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking at the exhalations, but, uh, but, but at least our staff uh, are not affected. Anyway, so people come in, they do their smoking, uh, they get, uh, you know, zero, seven, or in this case, 13% containing THC, and then they go into a driving simulator and they're monitored. And so, and the driving simulator actually is a pretty good indicator of on-road driving. Um, it's not perfect, but it's reasonably good. Anyway, here's, a, here's an example of one parameter, which is car following coherence. What is that? Well, you do this all the time when you drive, that somebody be in front of you slows down, you slow down, they speed up, you speed up, they do something else, you adjust. This is this coherence measure. How, how locked in are you to what the people ahead of you are doing? And it turns out, as you might expect, this coherence measure is disturbed when people are high on marijuana. And so the green line shows that those who uh, received active marijuana had reduced coherence. It wasn't a huge effect size, but, but it happened. And you can see how long it goes for that you uh, observe it within a half an hour, even earlier. Um, an hour and a half or something is probably the peak. And then after three to four hours, it, it wears off. Okay. So is that data clear? Um, and and yeah. the yellow line are the people who got the non-THC containing, of course. Um, yeah. Yes, go ahead. As a follow-on is, do you know if DMV is developing any sort of testing? Well, that's what I'm going to come to. 
Thanks. Thank you. Your, your guys' questions are terrific. I mean, you're yeah. asking the right stuff. Um, much better, by the way, than college students or our grad students. I think <laughs> I, maybe there's something to be gained by being a uh, an emeritus faculty member. You know, there's <laughs> some kind of wisdom here. Um, so uh, yeah, but to get to that, uh, one thing that Dr. Marcotte looked at was what was the relationship of this coherence measure to actual blood concentration of THC? And you don't have to be a statistician to see that that red line ain't going nowhere. And that even people who had very high THC levels didn't differ that much in their coherence. What seemed to matter is did they have some some in them uh, at all. So this partly addresses the question, can you have a so-called per se limit? Because in alcohol, you know that 80 milligrams per deciliter or 0 0.08 is the critical level. Beyond that, you're considered unfit to drive. And with alcohol, it actually kind of works because alcohol has a very linear effect. The, the more is in your blood, the worse you are at driving after you adjust for certain factors like how used are you to drinking and you know how much do you weigh and things like this. With THC, that's not the case. And it probably has to do with the fact that THC is rapidly redistributed to tissues and then it kind of you know seeps out of the tissues and so forth. So there is no per se level that you can have for THC. And uh, our uh, highway patrol uh, agrees to that. The other is um, the relationship of your self-perception to how safe are you or how stoned you are versus how do you actually perform on the simulator and you can see that um, uh, after about three hour, three and a half hours, most people who got the active ingredient said they're, they're safe to drive, okay? Um, but here's what actually happens. So this is the perceived impairment. People think that they're improved after a certain period of time. But when you look at the actual performance, the impairment lingers longer. So, it turns out self-perception is not a very good guide in this case. <laughs> How impaired you are, bless you. Uh, so there is this difference. Um, and then I will just conclude on this thing about the alcohol and marijuana combination. Uh, and basically, you can look past all the, all the little histograms, but the two red dotted lines is what matter. The, the, the delta between the top and bottom data, dotted line is the additive effect of a low dose of marijuana and a low amount of alcohol. So there is a significant additive effect here. And so I think that's actually a public health issue that's worth studying. Okay, so yeah, okay. Are there any other questions? There was a last minute question on, are there any studies on LSD at UCSD? Not LSD, but uh, there is a study that is um, uh, ongoing on psilocybin and uh, Professor Sidney Zizek, Z-I-S-O-O-K in the Department of Psychiatry um, is conducting that. Uh, you could probably reach him, those of you who are UCSD faculty and have uh, email accounts, it's uh, szizok, Z-I-S-O-O-K, at ucsd.edu. I don't know what the, um, where he is at with his study or whether they're currently enrolling, but not LSD, but psilocybin is, uh, is being looked at. Dr. Grant, please accept our sincere thanks from our members. This was an absolutely fabulous, fascinating talk, and we very much appreciate the time you dedicated to us. It's a pleasure, and who knows, I may be joining this group in a few we years. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope I'm as smart as you guys when I, when I reach uh, my retirement. <laughs> Here's a smoking help. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Okay, All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.